Well, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Uh, I would recommend some of you from the uh, tables far away. There are some slides that the, the font is not so big, so if you come, you want to join us here, and also, as I would like to make that an open discussion, if you feel comfortable to come here closer, you will enjoy more, I think. Well, this is, uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me for this conference today. And uh, uh, there were a couple of sessions, and I decided to put only one in order to make it more, more dynamic. So uh, we are going to talk about um, how to build up partnerships in animal health, and also during the uh, presentation I will give some, some examples some in order to make it more dynamic. Uh, nonetheless, uh, this is an open discussion, so I'll be very glad if at any time you stop me, make me questions, explain your experiences. Uh, I know it's, we have a microphone around so we, we can use it and uh, make it more dynamic. Uh, this uh, presentation uh, is based on uh, a training course that I've been giving over the last six years about partnerships in life science, which animal health, of course, is an important part of that. And uh, the, my experience on this training course, which is eight hours, so I'm on only going to talk one hour, not, not eight, but this, uh, the, the experience after the training course has been very interesting. So people said, you know, what you explained today, most of the things are common sense, and we all know, but we do not apply. And then when, when you see, put it all together, and when someone put all the pieces in, in, a, in a sequence that makes sense, after you are able to apply them and to be more successful. And on top, I've been following up some of my, the people have, that uh, fortunately I met during these courses and, and after years. And they say, you know, I still keep using the tools you gave us. So being very simple, sometimes you say, well, Sergi, you know, we know about that. Yes, most of it, I don't think you are going to learn anything new. But what we can explain to you is how we have been learning from more than 120 deals we have done over the last 11 years. And all the know-how we have been just putting up and putting up and trying to learn from experiences and building up the process that help us to be the more successful and more, let's say, using the time more in, a, in, the, better, in the better way. So again, please stop me at any point. So uh, we, we understand that if you want to build up a successful partnership, you need at least to follow these points. First of all, you need to understand the value chain. If you don't understand the value chain, and especially in the sector you are working, it's very difficult to move in between because most of the partnerships are done in, in a different levels of the value chain. Also, we need special personal skills and some key activities. So any person that is responsible in your organizations to develop partnerships should at least be sure that have these skills and uh, is focused on doing the activities we are going to mention. We are going to have three slides about the animal health market. I'm not going, this is not a conference about the animal health market, but we, uh, it is a message to say, well, if we want to play in certain market, we need to understand uh, where we are. And the most, let's say, deep part of the presentation is the structured phases we have developed to build up uh, long-term relationships, partnerships. A final note on the need of using IT systems, which uh, I'm not talking about Outlook. A lot of people use the email as a project management system, and this is the, the worst way to manage a project. Huh? So definitely there is a, a partnership, it's a project, a very complicated project, and should be done using the proper project management systems. And then there are some references of books that if anyone is interested to read, gives a little bit of, uh, of our learnings are coming from these books and also from, from experience. So uh, the animal health value chain, the first thing we need to understand is who is who. We see a lot of people that uh, try to move within the, uh, the certain sector and they start they do not start by understanding who is who in that sector. When we talk about animal health, when we talk about also life science, we have a lot of different stakeholders. And we have done a, an exercise in order to try to fit them all around this circle. 
We have the public authorities. And the public authorities, you know, are basically all the morning session was about regulatory, was about what the public authorities request us to arrive to the market. So it's an important stakeholder and we need to understand their expectations in order to let us move within this sector. Also, we have healthcare providers from a bed in a clinic to a bed that takes care of a farm or any stakeholder that really provides healthcare are elements of the value chains that we need to understand and we need to take in consideration. Again, their expectations, their needs, and their most probably their role in our business model. Also, we have the R&D centers, and R&D centers today are far away from the old, old uh, structured pharmaceutical companies. Most of that is based on scientific parts, parks, and we need to understand who is there, what are they doing, which is similar to what we have, and what kind of partnerships can we build up in the R with the R&D centers. Also, the academia is an important player in the animal health sector and on top the industry, which will take care of basically the commercialization of the assets that have to arrive to the final consumers. Around that, we have growing a business called data and e-health that it's collecting all the data that will allow in most of the cases to understand the sector, to provide data and to build up uh, all the uh, um, intelligence uh, around regulatory and marketing. And also we have more and more service providers. It's just a need to go around this conference. Uh, there are so many uh, contract manufacturing, contract sales, contract everything. So you can contract everything today. So you need to understand your, the ones that can help you to develop your partnership. Once you have the picture of that, most probably you do it from your own country, but you have to do it also on the territories you are thinking on and understanding exactly the same picture on the countries or territories that you are willing to achieve. You would not believe how many people try to, believe, to build up partnerships and you ask them, have you done that before? No, they don't have this information. How you can select a partner if you don't understand what is going around. So spend your time, by just it's very simple, it's just seven and sometimes uh, one of the stakeholders, you cannot fit it here, but I think most of them are here. And with this uh, chart, try to understand the expectations of all the stakeholders around. In the way you can achieve all the expectations, most probably the partnerships will be easier to build up and the speed to the market will be higher. Uh, it is, uh, I said classical one-way model of obstacles, the, the uh, life science animal health value chain, because at the end of the day, we, at least from the university, we all know that there is a starting point. This is very wide concepts, but it, it could be applied to any life science uh, value chain. Starting point, there are some basic research. There is uh, clinical translation in some way. There are the authorities in the middle with regulatory pharmacovigilance, a lot of requests. It's a big barrier that it has to be jumped. Most of the things we do before are to complain with this regulatory or authority, health authorities request. And then we have products and services to consumers. And more or less, we can think on a predictable future. And that's what, what is normally presented as the life science value chain. Well, from our experience, we said that this is not like this. And if we try to make a very simple picture, it really is a multi-directional process. And the difference between the previous slide in, and this slide is the partnerships you build up. Depending on who you partner with, definitely if you see that from a one year, two years, three years after, you see that the direction that your project, your, uh, your products, your technologies are moving forward, it really has a strong impact on your partnership. So the partnership decision at any time can make this chain longer if you don't choose the right partnerships. It's very important to see that from this point of view whenever you are the responsible to build up the partnership. If we make a zoom to that uh, small picture, 
we, we can have a similar picture like this. And this picture tries to show you that every single decision point, depending on the partnership you build up, you will go to the right, to the left, forward, but sometimes even backwards. And it's very important that each single process follows uh, certain steps in order to be not only successful, a successful partnership is not having a, an agreement in place. A successful partnership is the one that let us move forward in our expectations. So the evaluation of the success should be done, of course, after the signature and be sure that we are moving in the direction we were thinking on. So once we have uh, a, the first picture and understanding of what is going around, and this is a, a problem between uh, Apple and, uh, and PCs. Uh, I work in Apple, when you put in a PC, it makes it all up. So it, it is not like it should be. But nonetheless, uh, apologize for that. Those are the key elements of, of uh, partnership. The first one, which is not in the slide, well, it's on somewhere there, is trust. So we need trust. You need to trust on, on, on the partner you have in front of you. You need to respect. You need to have different skills. This point of the different skills is part of the deep analysis we're going to do far, far during the presentation. You need the compromise. You need clearly defining the expectations and understanding that in a partnership, your expectations and your partner's expectations normally are different. And if you don't manage their expectations, most probably, you, at some point in time, this partnership will not work. And also you need an exit strategy at the beginning. And this is one of the points people don't discuss because they are so enthusiastic on the partnership that they forget that if we clarify which is the key, the key exit strategy, uh, we will not have any problem whenever we arrive to a certain point. Nothing is forever. Well, maybe something is forever, but normally the partnerships we build up are not forever, are for a certain period of time and have a certain objectives. So defining an exit uh, for a strategy for your partnership, it's, it's one of the masts that uh, uh, more frequently than it should be, we forget about that. If we talk about the people that should do that, well, there's a lot of skills uh, to be responsible from a company point of view and say, well, we, we need to select someone that builds up the partnerships. And uh, well, you, you, of course, you need people that understand all the value chain, understands from the knowledge perspective about research, about manufacturing, so we don't need to be an expert on anything, but we need to understand what we're talking about. It's impossible to deal with uh, certain parts of the value chain if you don't understand them. So we need to understand the supply chain, development, sales and marketing, so this is knowledge, important point. Of course, you also need to have analytical skills that will let you, and as we will see on the next steps, analytical skills are tremendously important in order to understand who you are and what are you looking for. Otherwise, the partnership has no sense. One, one of the most important ones, under my point of view, is communication. And communication is about what you see here in, in the corner. You need to be able, from the input, the input comes from, of course, listening and reading, and the outputs come from speaking and writing. So. At this level, any person that is willing to take care of partnerships have to be someone that is able to listen, which is obvious. But a lot of people just go around with their stories, uh, sit in front of any booth and explain the story. And they never stop thinking, maybe I first listen to the other, learn if that's the right partner or not, learn if they have the skills I need, and then start explaining my story. So the listening point, which seems very simple, um, more frequently than we should expect is not there. But, and this is part of my, my, one of our aims and our, let's say, key points when we develop partnerships is the cultural communication. The cultural communication is, of course, not speaking English. Uh, most of us need to speak English in the level we can, of course we, we have different origin or native languages and we do our best in, in a foreign language. But talking, talking what, would, what we like to say, talking uh, cultures, we talk culture, what means talking cultures? 
Talking cultures means that you understand what another person means when say something under the culture point of view. And Bill, uh, I'm, I'm sure you have experiences around that. But when, when from a culture something is understood in one way and from other cultures is stood in another way, we can use the same words, but there is no common understanding. And these cultural misunderstandings are one of the, the biggest reasons for partnerships not to move forward whenever, even they, if you have a signature and agreement in place, whenever you start developing this partnership due to a cultural misunderstandings, you never rise to the right point. So the person that has to manage uh, to build up partnerships definitely has to understand cultures. Apart from that, we need, as I said, we understand the partnership as a project management uh, itself, so uh, the concept of project management, it's, it's a must there. Apart of that, again, apologize because I can guarantee you that at the beginning the, the pictures were on the right side. But the key activities, of course, is networking. Again, congresses like that are about that, but they are part of a process. But you know, networking is more than going to a CPHI or going to buy you in the US or going to buy you Europe or what else. This is helps, this definitely helps, but it's just the starting of the networking or it's just a step of the networking. Networking means, as you know, uh, spending time with people and building trustiness and building good relationships. And this really requests time and money, a lot of money to develop a good network. Within this uh, responsible of the partnerships, main activities will be the strategic analysis that we are going to talk about that, and also planning of the, all the work to be done and scouting. You see a lot of people, as a matter of example, in this Congress going up and down and just having a look to the different booths. Definitely, and I'm sure you, are, you agree with me, if you come to a, a Congress like this, just to walk up and down, you will be crazy. There are more than, I don't know, thousands of ex exhibitors and the probability of success, it's really very, very low. So if there is no a strategic analysis and a planning before coming here, it will make any sense to, for you except of having a good dinner tonight. So understanding that there is all these needs around and those are the activities and this is the profile, then we, we start to understand, again, remember, I said from the beginning, all that is very basic, but the experience is that a lot of people don't take care of all these things. So when we have the understanding of the life science, animal health, value chains, we have the skills and the profile of the people around we need, we need to understand the market, and today we are talking about animal health. Uh, maybe some of you come from the human side, Maybe some of you come and have experience on the animal side. The first number that surprised anyone is that the animal health business is of 22 billion. 22 billion. If you compare it to human, it's 50 times more the human. So this is the animal health business. It's 22 billion. I guess it's like one of the European uh, human health markets altogether, all the world. 22 billion. So. That's very important to understand when you manage expectations. I, I have some examples of uh, human health pharmaceutical companies thinking on an opportunity to translate some of their products to animal health. And whenever they start to look for partners, even before understanding these figures, and when they have, after a, a long process, the first sales forecast for a product say, this is ridiculous, what are they talking about? But this is clear not understanding of what you have in front of you. So a sales of millions of euros in animal health, it's really a big business. Whilst for certain human uh, pharmaceutical companies, if the, you don't achieve certain tens of millions or hundreds of millions, has no sense to move even a finger. So it's very important to understand the market we are approaching. And in this case, the animal health industry is around the world of 22.5 billion but there is a lot of, of profits and business to do here, but we need to understand the frame. Also, as you see, over the last 10 years, it has almost, in, in real terms, has doubled, and it keeps on growing. So it's a, it's a market that will grow, because within this market we have the animal production, which, as you know, the population is growing and need to be fitted, so we need more and more protein food. 
to give you, for the ones that don't know this sector, uh, to give you, uh, as I said, only three slides, but if we divide the animal health market by groups, 62% are pharmaceuticals, 20 something, 26% are biologicals, and 12% are medicinal feed additives. What is growing here is biologicals, more and more due to a lot of regulations, especially in animal production, the use of pharmaceutical is restricted, and the opportunity is the biologicals. And most of the big players have in their future pl uh, strategic plans, we want to be in biologicals, we want to grow in biologicals, well, w I want to be the leader in biologicals, so not all will be the leaders, but in any case, biologicals, especially vaccines to substitute antibiotics in, in the production, uh, in the animal production business is today a big, big opportunity. If we see by region, America represents the 47%, Europe 31%, and the other 22%. And if we see that from species, we have that the food animal represents almost 60% and companion animals 40%. Nonetheless, uh, let me just give uh, an important point here. Food animal industry is like car manufacturing industry. The price of a drug, the price of an antibiotic, or the price of a vaccine. It's really a key element on the production, on the chain production. And a farmer will see an antibiotic or will see a vaccine as a cost on the production. And they have a budget. They have, I don't know, five euros to say something to invest in a pig. So within these five euros, they have to put all the antibiotics, all the vaccines, everything there. And to increase that from five euros to six, it's a big problem for them because they can be out of the market. Whilst we, when we talk about companion animals, we are talking about a family, a member of the family, which I can eventually invest 100 euros for a vaccine for my dog. So even being the same market, when we talk about companion animals or production animals, are completely two different businesses. And when people jumping from one sector from, excuse me, from human to animal, they sometimes don't think about these, these differences. So again, whenever we think about building partnerships, we need to understand and we need to see what we're looking, especially not to lose time. And the third slide about the market, just to give a reference, in the US market in 2011, the big part of the, of the cake was the anti-parasitics, parasitics, and also anti-infectives still, but what is really, again, growing is the vac vaccine market from uh, biologicals. Just to give you a few references. But we can also go to other kind of references when we think on partnerships. That's an example of what is called the uh, Global uh, Innovation Index. I don't know if you heard about that, it's quite complicated, but it gives you a very nice picture of what, what happens in the world. Whenever we want to go to partnership internationally, we need to understand what is going on. Or whenever we go to the market to look for innovation, we need to understand where are the key players in innovation. This is a very, really complicated because it's not only innovation in health, it's innovation as itself. It mix all up. It is a work between the Cornell University, uh, also the, the World International Property, uh, Property Organization, the uh, WIPO, and um, well, there are 400, 142 economies, uh, represents almost the, the Eight, a ninety-eight point seven percent of the GDP. There are well. At the end of the day, the results is a, a slide like this, which is at least something to put in your desk and and have a view with uh, a couple of hours because it takes time to understand that. But you have in blue on the top side here the leaders and the size of the circles are the population. You have uh, the learners here. And you have the underperformers here. And it also it's important to understand that in, bl in black ink, you have the efficient innovators. And in the red ink, when you have a name, for example, my country is Spain, which is in nowhere, as always, it's an, an efficient innovator, OK? So if you put all that together and you try to analyze this slide, it, it can kill you to decide where you want to go or what you can bring to one uh, to your partnership. I'm not going to invest more because it's really complicated. So here we are. 
go a little bit back, we understand the life chain value chains. We hope to have some special skills. We now understand the market. That's a lot more than what a lot of people do before starting partnerships. So let's think that we, we start. We are the responsibles to build up a partnership uh, for our company. What should be done? And this is one of the most simple, but at the, at the same time, most useful, uh, let's say, um, work we have done. As you see, it's very simple. We say, if you want to build up a successful partnership, first of all, you have to follow these four steps, very simple steps. But if you don't follow them, most of the cases you will need to go back and forward and back and forward in order to find out the information. How we, how we have been building that up is basically by managing hundreds of partnerships and all the learnings put back and put back and all the, basically, you know, learnings come from mistakes. So whenever you make a mistake, go back, take note, put it in your process and back and forward. So we recommend to uh, develop your partnership in four phases, okay? And we have called these phases in a very simple way, what we call the desk phase. So it means don't touch the market, don't call anyone, don't break your temptations to call someone and work before you, you even take your phone. Then we, when you have all that, and we are going to go deeply because this for us is the most important phase, then you have what we call exchange phase because you start to exchange information up and down. And this phase has a peculiarity under your point of view, and is that you have to treat this phase as a competitive process, like uh, horses riding and trying to arrive to the end, if you don't work in a competitive way, you will not have enough information to take a decision. So really, it's very important that you manage this exchange phase in a competitive way. Then you will arrive, if you are successful, to a certain negotiation phase where there are different parts to take in consideration. And if you are lucky, you will sign an agreement. And then, again, you are at the beginning of the process. But nonetheless, you at least, you have certain guarantees that you have selected the best partner, not because the other side is smiling, but also because you, deep, you did a deep analysis and you arrived to the conclusion that that was your best partner. So what we have to do within these different phases? Within the desk phase, basically, we have to make a SWOT analysis. Let's say, oh, SWOT analysis, I learned that when I went to the business school, when I was in the university. But what happens? A lot of people forget about doing this SWOT analysis. And as we are going to see, the SWOT analysis is really essential to define the profile of your partnership. Otherwise, what are you looking for? Normally, you're looking for to someone that complements your weaknesses. So if you don't understand your weaknesses, it's very difficult to build up a partnership. Another important point, you need to build up a business model. How you can attract someone if you don't have a proposal of a business model? It doesn't matter if your business model is to take transfer or your business model is to sell diagnostic uh, kits for uh, pigs. It doesn't matter. You need to build up the business model and attract your partner with an existing business model, with a proposal of a business model. You need to plan, you need to scout, and you need to build up a certain set of documents before doing anything else. So here, we say between one to three months. Sometimes it takes even longer. Sometimes it takes half a year to prepare all that. But Going to the market, coming to a congress like this, trying to call someone before doing that is a waste of time. Because sooner or later, you will need all that. And then you start to lose your time and the other part time. And, and on top, you cannot coordinate in a competitive process. So at the end of the day, better to have all that in place. And whenever you have that, start your process, but not before. Then you will, we will enter into the exchange phase, negotiation, and blah, blah, blah. So let's go for the first one. If you remember the picture I showed you at the beginning of the presentation, if we go even deeper to this process is what is represented in this picture. It's the partnership process and the different phases. And this tries to represent that the selected partners, you, you will be losing them on the process in the different phases. And at the end, you will build up a partnership with one of them. And in this process, you will follow we suggest you to follow what we are going to present now. 
So let's go for the first one. The first one, famous SWOT analysis that some of, most of the times we forget about that. You all know. SWOT analysis about the strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats. Okay. So why I need to do that? First of all, because if I want to track someone, I should follow, uh, show my strengths. Otherwise, there's nothing to do. So I'm good in this and this and this. And I have to say, this is the part that most of us prepare the best. And we have very nice iPads, PowerPoint presentations, everything to show our strengths. Okay, so that is part that is already done most of the times. What we normally don't do is to talk about our weaknesses. And really, you, maybe you have gone through that in the past. If you understand your weaknesses, this is where you start to see what, what you need, really. Because if I'm not good in this, my partner should go, be good in this. If I don't have the, uh, I don't know, regulatory expertise, I should find someone that is good in regulatory. If I don't have the manufacturing capabilities in biologicals, maybe I need to find someone that is good in biologicals. And the best way to convince someone that is the best partner for you is to show your weaknesses and to show that you have already gone through the analysis, that you have selected him or her or them because you have this need and they perfectly fit with your needs. So there is a good partnership. You are showing that there is a good partnership from the beginning. The opportunities are a must. You, you, you need to go to the market. You need to see where the opportunities are for you, for your business model, but also for your partner to be attracted for the opportunities. And of course, we need to see from the market point of view the threats that we are going to face. And we together should be able to jump these threats or fight or look for another partner that help us to survive. So um, this is old business school pictures but it's still very useful from the internal point of view, from the external point of view, from the positive side, and from the negative side. Do this analysis before you do anything else. And that, especially from the weaknesses point of view, is where you still, you will start to build up the profile of your partnership. So from the strengths, that's exactly what your partner is looking for. Because they say, well, look, I'm good on that, I'm good on that, let's build up a partnership here, okay? You, you need to show that. From your weaknesses, those are the reasons for you to look for a partner. If you don't make this analysis, what are you doing here? Just walking ar around does not make a lot of sense. The opportunities is why you should partner, definitely. And the threats, it's that what both of you should be ready to fight against and be ready and prepared to arrive and to jump and to arrive to the end. So definitely, without a SWOT analysis, looking for a partner looks like does, make, does not make a lot of sense. That's not so old. When we talk about business modeling, so SWOT analysis, I know, this, it's very, very old, but they are very useful tools. When we talk about business modeling, that's an old story. When we talk about business modeling, we're talking about how an organization uh, creates, delivers, and captures value from any economical, social, culture, or other forms of value. For a non-profit organization, the value should be captured in a different way. Within our, let's say, frame, the animal health uh, arena where we are now, we should understand how we can create value, how we can deliver this value, and how we can capture value from the market. So I highly recommend you to spend a lot of time building up a good business model for your products, for your technologies, for the partnership. Even more, I would say, this business modeling should be the modeling of the partnership, should be the modeling that you put on the table and see, look, if you partner with me, this is what we are going to do together. This is our value proposition. This is our uh, customer segments, blah, blah, blah. Today, and I think for the last three years, there is like a phenomenon called, called the business model generation. And this is a gentleman that might uh, work a lot on that, uh, build up this nice picture, and he's very successful, so most probably what he's talking about makes a lot of sense. It's a very simple way to build up your business model. If you have never gone through that, spend your time. I don't have anything to do with these people, but it it's really useful. Because whenever someone has to build up a business model, it's like crazy. And especially if you are people from 
uh, a scientific background, you don't understand business modeling, and it makes crazy to start and say, oh, my goodness, after the SWOT analysis that I it took really long time for me, now I have to build up a business model. It really, it's it, it what makes a partnership sense. If you don't make a business model, if you don't put on the table how someone is going to trust on you, how someone is going to invest time for partnering with you. So this business model, it's very, very simple. So you can play with that. If you are able to figure up everything in this picture, you have a business model. And how to read this business model? Look, on one side, you have the customer. So potentially you know who your customers are, but you need to think about that. Because if you, you are transferring a technology, the transfer is not the farmer. The transfer is, the customer is not the farmer. The customer is not the bet. The customer are the companies that are going to build up or buy a technology transfer. But also, for you the customer could be that one, because you are not partnering, you are selling. But you need to think, on the business model of your potential partner or buyer to let them understand the, the model that they will be able to apply with your technology. And you are the best one to understand. If I have a technology from a hospital, a bed hospital, that is used, I don't know, in, in traumatology, and I only think on selling or transferring my technology, but I don't waste time to make a business model for, I don't know, just a matter of example, for Elanco, to understand the business that is behind this technology, most probably someone at Elanco, just to follow the example of an animal health company, someone will do that. And you have the risk that whenever they build up the business model, they say, this is not of our interest. And maybe in that business modeling, there are some assumptions that are not correct, but you have lost your opportunity. So instead of thinking that someone is going to build up the business model for your product or for your technology, do it for them. Because you are the one that knows the best. Because most probably your product or your technology comes from the experience, comes from the market. So the best thing to do that is to build up the business model for them. And at the end, the customer has a need. And your product, your technology, is basically your value proposition. You have a solution for that need. So build up the need define the need, define the value proposition, which is the solution, and from that point, you have the minimums. Then, of course, you need to think how my value proposition will be delivered to the customer. And this is important. It's not the same to have a product that is used in animal production, that you need a bed, you need a farm, you need a certain stakeholders, than a product that is going to be used for uh, kidney disease in, in, in cats where the model is completely different, you have bets, you need someone to visit the bets, the bets are going to buy and sell the solution, and the customer is the owner of the, of the cat. So it, even in animal health, the two big businesses, animal production and companion animals, have completely different business models. And maybe your technology, your product, or your solution, or your value proposition has a business in one of those, but does not have a business in the other one. So if you don't make the exercise before, most probably you're losing time to look for the right partner. Of course, there's a way you need to think about building up relationships with the customers, so how your product will be delivered to the customer and how th this value will be built up and, and the relationships between who is providing the value proposition to the customer. You need to think about that. And on top, this is the most important thing, how your revenue streams will come. Who is going to pay, how much, which is the value chain, which is the supply chain, and at the end, where the money comes from, and what is the bottom line of that. On the other side, we have the back, this is the stage, and this is the backstage. And in the backstage, we have the key activities we have to do to deliver the value proposition to the customers. We have the key resources, we need to do that. And more and more, we need less key resources, and we have more key partners. This is like talking about outsourcing, and this is talking about partnership. And here are your partners. At the end of the day, when you build up this picture, if you are somewhere here, here is where you place your partner. And you say, look, in this business model, you are here. And why you are here? Because you have this know-how, you have these capabilities, you have this technology, you have something I don't have, and instead of 
having by my own instead of having employees that I bring this knowledge from em employers, I will bring this knowledge from key partners. And all that in the backstage has a cost. And the difference between the revenues and the cost, here in the middle, you have a profitable business model or not. So, believe me, maybe it sounds a lot of work. Maybe it sounds far away from your thoughts. Maybe it sounds that, you know, this man here is crazy. But if you are able to make your SWOT analysis, and you are able to build up a business model which is really simple, the probability of success of your punishes will increase. I don't know if it's from 10 to 12 or from 50 to 90, but definitely if you approach on one with all these tools in your hands and being sure that the one you have in front of you is the right one to be here because of your weaknesses, the probability of success of your partnership is higher. The probability that the one in the other side listen to you and say, look, this person has something to explain. This person has gone through a long process that in most of the cases, I am supposed to do that. So if you go with this proposition in your table, the probability of the other part to take in consideration, to listen to you, to take it seriously, it's higher. And it, this is what you're looking for. So spend your time, take your time in the desk phase, take your time in your desk, do all these documents, do all these analysis, and then you will be better prepared for a successful partnership. Uh, this is the normal document that is used for this kind of work. And uh, you, there are a lot of mentors worldwide happy to help you to build that up. But it's easy to do. It's just a matter of reading a little bit and you can do it. Okay, a part of this strategic analysis, we need to plan. Uh, we cannot go to do partnerships without planning. And you know, when, when you plan, you need to understand your objectives of the company, of your company, and to plan accordingly. You need to listen to the boards, you need to listen to the direct, the more or less, let's say the, the understanding of the company, where they want to arrive, which are the resources you have, et cetera, et cetera. You need to create and, and, and maintain the company strategy, evaluate your company's portfolio, products, do all the kind of analysis, blah, blah, blah. So this is important. Normally, well, this is very old, but remember that the objectives have to be really smart. So you have to be specific, have to be measurable, have to be achievable. Sometimes the objectives are not achievable, and then you have the frustration at the end of the year. They have to be realistic and timely. Objectives without the timing have no sense. Th achievable things have to be achieved in a certain period of time. When you plan, the, within the plan, before going out, please think about the type of deal you want and you're looking for. Don't go for a partnership and say, you are the right partner, but you know, I'm open to discuss any kind of partnership. Say, Come on. You, you, you need to think about what you have and what your expectations. And if you are thinking on acquire something, is that you, it's, it's different if you look for a contract manufacturing that you're looking for acquiring a, a manufacturing plan. Of course, but this should be clear from the beginning. Maybe this example is very clear, but sometimes if you talk to technology transfer offices from a bad faculty, they would say, well, we don't know. Well, okay, do we know? So let, let's sit down, let's try to understand the value of the different propositions, and let's try to understand what you want before we go to the market. The worst thing to go to a partnership is saying, I'm open to any model. That, that really means that you don't understand the market and you have not worked properly on understanding. So basically, as you know, the models we can go around is about acquisitions, mergers, licenses, joint ventures, or other, um, other kind of deals. And the key factors to go around that is the scale of the economics involved, the sizes of the parties, the culture of the companies. There are companies that always go around uh, by acquiring, acquiring, acquiring. So this is a cultural issue. Uh, the penetration you are expecting, special circumstances, and also, as you know, the most frequent, if there is an IP, remember that we cannot license something that has no uh, intellectual property. Licensing means give the rights of a certain intellectual property for another to develop what else. So basically, we will go through in or out licensing. Within the licensing model, the classical licensing model, uh, you remember it's a permission. Eh? When you give a license to someone, it's a permission from the owner of an asset 
to make the use of the asset for a specified purpose, period and time, and defined geography. The owner remains on the licensor point of view, that's very important, and there are basic terms you need to think about before going to the market, before starting the next phase. You need to think about exclusivity, sole exclusivity, semi-exclusivity, non-exclusivity, uh, the duration, the brand name if exist, the geographic areas, price. Uh, there is a lot of mix on, on the concept of, of transactions. People talk about um, fee. When, when there is a fee, I, I like to use the word of deal fee. A fee linked to a deal or license fee, which is linked to the license. And then you have upfronts, you have milestones, you have r royalties. But people mix the upfronts and the royalties and the commissions and, and everything up. So it's, it's basically trying to take the concept and divide it in time. Everything that is paid at the beginning will be an upfront. Everything that is paid during the time will be milestones. And everything that is linked on sales will be royalties. And it's as simple as this. But sometimes there is a mix on all these things. There will be, you can think on the price of the license, regulatory restrictions, traceability, reimbursement hurdles. There's a lot of different things. But again, Think about, plan about the, the model you want to apply. Put it in your business model, go out and show to the partner that exactly you want that. And then it comes the scouting process, which is long, takes time, and should be done under our point of view, should be done with time enough. And this is scouting process is not exactly going up and down in the corridors, it's more a desk work. So that's why for us, the scouting process keeps being on the, uh, on the desk. So the first thing you have to do is, okay, I, with all this information I have now, I have some criteria. So I have my criteria and I know the profile of the company I'm looking for. I know the therapeutic areas, if uh, we talk about therapeutic areas, if we talk about diagnostic or uh, anything we talk about. I know the territory I'm thinking on and I, I know the reasons for contacting. No? So, you have your criteria definition. You need to have a list of criteria definition to select the proper partners for you. You have your SWOT analysis. Don't forget about the SWOT analysis. That gives you the best criteria. I need someone that complements my weaknesses, someone that is able to value my strengths, someone that is able to see the opportunity in the market. Okay, then you need to make market research. And your market research starts from your network, all your network in your life that you can use, and new tools like LinkedIn, blah, blah, blah. Public information, there is amazing tones of public information. All the information I'm showing you about market is public. I never bought this information. It's there, it's available. So there's a lot of public information. There are bio clusters that are more and more willing to support uh, any partnership in the world. There are business development associations. You know, there are pharma licensing groups. There are bed groups. There are all, all these kind of groups have annual meetings and it's the best way to shank to shake hands, to meet people, to talk to them, and to build up the proper network for you. There are databases that you can pay, very expensive, but in a certain needs could be uh, a, a need and can save a lot of time. And there's medical societies, pet societies, all these kinds of societies. So with the criteria, you look for the information and you create a long list of candidates. Whenever you have this long list, which is normally very long, try to apply some filters because if not, the competitive process will be, uh, will be very complicated to manage. No? We always recommend not to manage more than 30 to 50 companies at the same time for one project. Sometimes the list has 100 companies. I need to apply some kind of filter. I need to clean that up and not manage 100 companies in parallel, which could be absolutely crazy. No? So our recommendation to give you a number will be around 30, maximum 50. So apply some filters. Start to think, what kind of filters can I apply? Do I have a previous experience with them? Anyone has a previous? I can call my friends, I can call my colleagues, say, look, in my list there is a company called blah, blah, blah. Uh, do you have an experience? Oh, forget about them. It's absolutely crazy to make a deal with them. Okay, yeah, you have a criteria. Then you, the quality of the data, the way they present themselves, the, any data you can have. Remember that you need to partner with people of the same size as you, and whenever you partner with bigger one than you, you need to build up some tools to be ready for that. So the dimension of the company in front of you could be a criteria, other reasons. And from this filter, you will have a short list. Okay, this short list will be the best
for your weaknesses, we, we should be the best, the best for you to contact. And before contacting, a lo a lo another long work you have to do is to select the right person. And selecting the right person is not just by sending an email to someone that looks in a website. It's to contact the company, to talk to them, uh, ask for who is the right person in this organization to present something like this. Believe me, when you have done all the work on the SWOT analysis, on the business modeling, when you have all these tools in your hands, if you contact a company and say, look, I have gone through an analysis, I think I have a good asset for you, I have a good business model proposition for you, and I need to talk to the right people that understand what I'm talking about, it's very hard that they don't give you the name that of the person that you should contact. So that's also an important work to be done. Another step, look, we are still on the desk phase. We are still preparing ourselves to go to the market. How many times people go to the market without doing all these things? We need to prepare some documents. And normally we divide the documents between the non-confidential documents and the confidential documents. The non-confidential documents for us, apart from the, you know, people think that patent documents are a confidential document and the patents normally are published, no? So if it's published, just put it on the table the first day. It makes life easier for all of us. Also, the, if there is any published clinical data, fantastic. And the most important document for us is what we call the partnership opportunity. And I think it's good that you call like this, partnership opportunity. If someone receives a document and the headlines is partnership opportunity, they see the opportunity from the beginning. And then you start describing this opportunity for them. We will go on the next slide for this document. The confidential docs from full non-published clinical data, field trials, anything you have in a data room ready prepared to be shared. Normally recommended use a data room, don't send documents by mail. Any intellectual property that is not still patent, any modeling valuation that you have done, any confidential company information that you could share, uh, strategic plans, uh, evaluation results, term sheets, every, all that belongs to the confidential docs. Prepare everything before knocking any door. Because if you have a partnership that goes very fast, you will be ready to respond immediately and you will not lose the fantastic momentum that you can create when someone feels that they are the right partner. Just to go for a moment for this document, for us, it's the most important document in a partnership process. We call them partnership opportunity because it's an attra attractive way to present yourself. And this is the key, key, is the key to open the door, is how you knock a company where you have been investing a lot of time in a deep analysis, you understand exactly what is going on, and you need to tell them, look, I select your company because after a deep analysis, you are the best partner for me. It makes such a big difference. And I can guarantee you, if you do that, and if that company really fits with you, you will have a meeting in less than one month with them. Because you are doing everything they have to do. Everything is done, everything is on the table. Everything makes sense. And when things make sense, people are very open to receive you and to discuss about that opportunity. You have to talk about the value proposition, as we mentioned your strengths, I'm very good on this, this, and this. Talk about the market opportunity, customers, and the customer segments. Talk about the weaknesses and why you are looking for a partner. Don't make a standard document, it's horrible. It's like someone is inviting you for something, and, and imagine that someone invites you for a, I don't know, a wedding, and it says, dear guest. Say, okay, you like to say, dear Sergi, we are willing to invite you to our wedding, but not dear guest or dear individual. So when you prepare this partnership opportunity, make it for all, but then have a part where you describe why I have selected you. It is really impressive. When, continue with the example of Elanco, and I, I have very good friends in Elanco, do a lot of things, so I mentioned that company because it's animal health, and we are today in animal health. If you say why Elanco in a, in a document that is, by the way, this document never more than one sheet, maximum two, but don't send 150 slides presentations. Still people do that for the first contact, it's ridiculous. Nobody's going to read a 150 slides presentation if they never met you before. Just two pages, but include all this information and talk about why I have selected you.
because you have in this portfolio this product, my product fits with your portfolio of R&D. In the market, you have these products and that would perfectly complement your portfolio. You have the capability in regulatory that I don't have. You have the expertise in this market that we don't have. That, that proves, first of all, you are doing the work that they are, most of the people expect the others to do. And secondly, the, the speedness and, and, and the, uh, your proposal will be on the table very fast. And they will be willing to spend money with you rather than with others because you have clear ideas. And most of the people try to make partnership without doing this kind of analysis. So say clearly why you have selected them. This is very important. Don't send standard documents and prove that the partnership makes a lot of sense. Believe me, this is where we put more effort. And we, that's the result of all the desk work. And we put, you put all this work in one sheet, put it on the table on the selected short list of candidates, the probability that they say yes and you obtain a meeting is really high. It's not 100%, but if in the normal way it's 10, in this way maybe it's 50. I don't know, I don't know the percentage. But definitely will help you to that. I'm not going to talk about CDAs. You know CDAs are today a must. There's some kind of gentleman agreement here because following up a CDA in the globalization. So I think that the CDAs come from 50, 60, 70 years ago. Today the globalization makes the CDAs a, a little bit a crazy issue, but nonetheless out there, a formality have to be done and follow it and respect it. M my suggestion for some experiences don't call them NDAs because the NDA is also uh, a new drug application and it's, it's, it's better to go to the CDA and basic things. Don't try to make a CDA for the first contact as a CDA for a due diligence. It's better to have a, because some people lose their hours and days discussing a CDA for the first meeting. Okay, it's good to have a CDA, but should cover the first meetings. If we arrive to due diligence, we will sign another CDA for the due diligence. But trying to have a CDA that is at the level of a due diligence just to have a meeting, it makes a little bit no sense. And sometimes the discussion of a CDA just never rises to an end and you never meet the, the people, no? So try to make it simple. And there is another model which is called material transfer agreement that is like a CDA when you need to transfer some goods for the other side to test the goods, no? So there is a special agreement for that. I'm not going to talk about valuation. That's it. So definitely, before contacting, before coming here, before doing anything, do all this work, and you will be definitely more successful. That's what we are talking about today, about being success in partnerships. Okay, so the exchange phase. I have all the documents in my desk, in a folder, anywhere. Really prepared, I know the people who I'm to going to talk, names, surnames, even more, I have a reference. If I can contact someone and someone knows them, much better. So let, let's go for that. Let's start. And start with the 30 at the same time, the same day. At the same day, just send all the information. And let them know that this is a con competitive process. It helps a lot to speed up the process, definitely. Nobody's going to feel bad because you say, look, I'm doing this process with 30 companies and I need results in three months in order to take a decision. That's normal. You need to select the best partner and the, the selection criteria comes from the market. So you need them to move in parallel, okay? You know, this old tool, I, I think yeah, it's familiar, no? Although we have today the, the amazing tools in our pocket, you, you cannot believe that this, that I don't know how many years old it is, 50, 60 years, 70 years old, it's, it's still, and I think even more for the technologies we have today, something that people don't use, even at this level. So the, the difference, and, and I know I'm talking about things that we all know, but we don't do. So the difference between having a document, taking the phone, calling someone, hello, Anyway, Mr. Smith, look, I'm blah, blah, blah. I work for this company. I've been working for the last th three months to select the best partner based on this, this, and this, and arrive to the conclusion that your company is one of the best partners for us because this, this, and this. Therefore, if you let me, I will send you a document that is only one sheet. You are going to take 10 minutes to read the document. Please have a look to that. 
discuss with your colleagues, I will call you back next week, and let me know if that could be of your interest or not. If that is of your interest, then we can move forward. The difference between using this old machine or the value of this old machine that is talking, not sending a mail, talking, doing this simple exercise for your product, it's your product, you want to build up a partnership, come on, take the phone and call, send the document. The people will be so impressed. See, why people are impressed for a phone call? Because people don't do that. People just call friends. People call for talking and talking, but to follow ups, but not for the first contact. And it's easier to send an email to someone that you don't know rather than talking the phone and having a conversation with someone that you don't know. It's a good way to start up a relationship. It's a good way to be polite, to be known, to, and to let them know, look, this document you received today is not a result of a banner. It's not a result of a massive uh, emails. It's a result of a deep work within three to six months and the selection of your company because you have certain capabilities, know-how that we don't have, and we together, we can do something in the market. Uh, and it's, it's very simple to say that. So the reality says that people send emails to people they don't know. And what happens then? It goes to spam and nobody read these documents. So all the work you have done to prepare that, just because you don't take the phone and you make a call, you know, how many mails do you receive every day? The, the average today is 100. That's more or less the, between 75 to 150, depending. So people read what people, it's, it's, it's very interesting to analyze the psychology of the emails. What you look for in your emails, you look for the answers you are waiting for. So you look for that email that you're waiting from someone for this, this, and this. So you filter the mails by the things you know. And you don't take care about the mails that are from people you don't know. And rarely you are going to read a mail that comes from someone you don't know. It's very strange. It's rare. So why to put in risk your project to send an email to someone that is not waiting for your mail? Come on, just make a call. Let them know. And they will be waiting for your mail. They say, ah, no, this is the gentleman the polite gentleman that called me and said that he invested six months to decide I could be a partner. I'm going to read the document. So it's, it's human psychology. It's very simple. It's very simple. It's common sense. People don't do. Okay. So contact the right person, please, and phone him. Call be polite, present yourself. I said, yeah, but it does not happen. How many calls do you receive like this? Not so many, no? So something is wrong here. Present yourself, your company, explain the reason for the call, ask if the person is the right one. That's also important. Maybe you spend three months talking to someone and at the end say, well, you know what? I'm not the right person to talk about that. Come on. So maybe I better ask at the beginning, are you the right person for a evaluation? Like, no, but you were so polite that I decided to continue the conversation with you. Okay. So be sure that is the right person. Agree to send the information, very short, the partnership opportunity document. Look for a simple answer. Is that of your interest? Yes or no? It's not of your interest. Don't waste your time. Don't waste my time. If it's of your interest, then let's go farther. No? <clears throat> Agree a follow-up in two days, three days, one week, not more than that, and call for the follow-up, of course. If there is no, thank you very much for your time. Try to understand the reasons why they are saying no, because there's something wrong in your analysis. So maybe you can learn from this no. And if there is a yes, then we, you can move to, the move to the next slide. And the next slide, although we are in the, this uh, globalization, communication, and fabulous age that we can do everything with the tools we have in the pocket, uh, you, we are talking about 30 companies. We are talking about your product. We are talking about your future. Spend your time, take a plane, and go to visit the company that has say yes. Go to visit them. Don't think. or use one of these events to visit them. Of course, if you are in September and you have, you start this process in July and in September you start to have the yes, the best thing is to use a CPHI or another Congress to meet people. But that has nothing to do rather than coming here to walk up and down because you come here with the 30 yes or the 20 yes and it's the first time you shake hands, you save a lot of money because you have all around but it's a valuable time for you and for them. And they are waiting for you. And when you arrive and you have your agenda of the, your 20 meetings, it's amazingly valuable, these kind of congresses. What is, has no sense is to stop in, the, in front of a booth and say, that could be a good partner for me or not. Let, let's try. Oh, yes, they say they were very kind. They give me the business card. 
That's for nothing. Absolutely a waste of time. Okay, so this is the first meeting. Our suggestion is really prepare it. Go you, you first, because it's different to see a company. You need to see the eyes helps you to evaluate the, the partner. So you need to, to see who is who. You need to understand the, the way they react when someone visits them, because it's going to be your partner. You need to understand the time they invest, how they treat you, how they take care of your needs, your basic needs, how they prepare the meeting room, how many people are attending the room. Also try to uh, prove your interest, shake hands, all these things. But very important, before going there, try to have as much people as possible. People go for meetings and sometimes don't ask who is going to attend the meeting. I always recommend not only ask, but also suggest. I'm going to come with my scientific department. I'm going to come with my regulatory experts. I would like to have your scientific experts, your regulatory experts, your sales and marketing people in front of me. And then this meeting can move the project forward in an amazing rapidly speed. It's, it's amazing how if you prepare everything, you have a good agenda, but those meetings takes time to prepare and on top are normally one, not one day, but one morning or one afternoon meeting. But the value of this meeting has nothing to do with um, a spontaneous meeting. Then you establish contact with all the people. A key question, always ask, which is the decision process within your organization? And make them just take a note, uh, use the white paper on the wall and, and drive for you. Because if you understand the decision process, you will be able to manage the, your expectations and you will be able to understand who is who, who takes the decisions, the time you will need for all the process, the people you need to talk with. You need to know personally, talk to all the decision makers in the process. So it's very important that you understand which is exactly the, the decision process within the company. Of course, there will be time for them to present themselves, yourself, the technology, the product, and the, your SWOT analysis, your value proposition, your business model, all the things you have been working on the desk phase, now it's the moment to put it in front of them, and they will be impressed, really. I, I haven't seen so many companies going to a meeting for the first time and presenting SWOT analysis and, and, and business modeling. And it's basic to build up a partnership. You can build it up in the future, but time is money, and the faster you can do all that, the, the, you will have uh, better results and better partnership for sure. So, before the meeting, CDAs, deep analysis on the company profile, agenda including all the, the points you want to cover, giving access to confidential documentation before, give access to information to let people be prepared for the meeting, and a recommendation from someone that comes from a Latin country as myself, try to have time for lunch, for dinner, talk, know personally who you have in front of you, the relationships you can build up outside of the of the meeting room gives a lot of value. I have a ex recent example, which has been really amazing. We did all this process for a customer of us. It was a Swiss company. They wanted to, uh, they, they have already done all the, the work quite well, and they selected one company. And they said, look, Sergi, we want to meet with this company. So I said, well, my understanding of doing things like this, do you agree with that? Yeah, yes, let's do that, okay. So we prepared all that and we got uh, the partnership opportunity document. We sent that, we talked to the people. They said, yes, definitely we are interested. We got a meeting. The meeting was a full day with all the experts in both sides. I have to say from the business development director from that big company said, it's one of the first times in my life and it's a person of the, his 60s said, it's the first time in my life I've seen a meeting like this and it's really amazing, and I'm going to put all my efforts to continue on that. I commit myself to give you an answer in one month. Okay. Fantastic, that was very good. So after one month, I was doing the follow-up every week, as we normally do, and after one month, he said, look, unfortunately, my marketing people said they don't see the, the market as you see. So we went with the, the value of the market and the sales forecast and everything. So we are not going to continue. I say, oh, thank you very much. Thanks for your time.
But you know what? I, I would like to have a face-to-face -face meeting to discuss that because uh, it's so big the difference between what we or what our customer suggests and you are suggesting that maybe something wrong. Okay, so they said, thanks to the meeting, the hours in best, the dinner we got that day, thanks to all that, a lot of people would say no. I'm not, I said no, my marketing people say no, I'm not going to invest a single meal. They said, yes, you can come back and we are going to discuss that. So we went back and amazingly, during the discussion, we make them think about points that they did not take in consideration during the evaluation. So now this project is open again. All that has been possible through this process. I'm quite sure that using the, let's say, the standard way of doing partnerships will be absolutely out and no way to invest a, a single minute more on this project. So if you enjoy doing that, doing that and if you apply all that, I know it looks a lot of work, but then things happen faster. You are more successful and then you really, at the end, you have the right partner in front of you. So I, I explain these things because I believe on that and I, I build up from basically from experience. So what do you have to do after the meeting? Follow up, like uh, Sherlock Holmes, no? So you have to take care of all the next steps. You, you are supposed to understand the process, so call all the people, uh, try to understand where's the document, where's the evaluation, if one department has say yes, no, if the difficulties are on the R&D people, on the marketing people, on the regulatory people, try to save th uh, time for them, try to help them, try to answer them, try to have a document of questions and answers. But don't, don't, uh, yeah, so many people say, I don't have any answer from these people, okay? Since when? Oh, three months ago. And did you call them? No. Uh, what you are work, w waiting for? Uh, I wanted them to call me. Okay, just keep waiting. So, you know, we have so many things, we do so many things, thanks to the globalization, we do so many things per day, apart of answering 150 mails. We have to do so many things that sometimes if there is no uh, follow-up from the other side, it's absolutely lost. So remember, make a follow-up, okay? By phone, conversations, conference calls, solve any doubt by conference calls, make as many. You know, conference calls today are very cheap, so you can organize conference calls almost every week. It's not so complicated to organize a 15 minutes conference call you, you can have people from all around the world in a conference call, discuss where we are, okay, and let's go to the next step and make the effort, be the leader of this process, okay? We suggest that is if you have done the effort to go, then invite them to come, if everything goes on the right way, next, next meeting, invite them to come to visit you and to know you better and, and, and take care, very important. Another stupid thing, it's not the same to arrive to Singapore and manage by yourself if it's the first time than arriving to Singapore and someone is waiting with, with an iPad with your name. And that's not cost anything, really. What, how much it costs? 100 euros to send someone to pick up a, a potential uh, partner in the airport? Do it. That is, that's not, it's, it's irrelevant for your budget. But make the life of the people uh, arriving to meet you easier. It's, it's these kind of details that will can make a partnership different, okay? So take care of logistics, everything they need. If you cover the basic need, I've been in a meeting without a glass of water. Of course, in the second hour, you start thinking about where's the, the water, where's the water, and, and then you, you cannot think on, on what is going on. If you take care of all the needs, again, we are building personal relationships. About the bio partnerings, all in one, you know, these congresses where you have almost 30 to 60 meetings in two days, which is absolutely out of any sense. But this, in some way, helps on all this process, but it never substitutes a face-to-face -face meeting. In models like CPHI, yes, because here are not slots of 30, 15 minutes. Everyone has both, you can take your time, you can have your agenda, you can have a meeting every hour, that's different. But when you go to the Bio Europe or the Bio in the US and you have 30 minutes meetings, this is basically helps you to filter your long list, but not more than that. And most of the people that attend these meetings, they also have 60 meetings. So at the end of the day, if you do the proper work before, the probability that you have certain 
part of their brains to remember, yeah, I met that gentleman that came with a document and was saying exactly, let's start by this one because it makes my life easier. And the other one that was only talking by himself and blah, 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 I still don't see the opportunity. So I put it at the end. So if you do the, the work properly, the, the bio partnering helps, but it's simply a, an additional tool, but never substitute a day meeting where you can work and all that. The when, when to have a due diligence, of course, is whenever people confirm the interest and they want to go deeper, they want to go to a due diligence on what can be audited, regulatory dossiers, uh, manufacturing plans, and all these things. So it's really should be under our point of view something to be done when there is a strong confirmation of interest, when really people confirm that they are on board, and even sometimes at certain point after negotiation. Because there are some terms that if the terms don't make possible the deal, you don't need to open the doors such, a, such deeply, no? such a, in a deep way. So, so all that is about exchange. Remember, do it in a parallel process. Try to have a lot of information and try to put all this information in front of you and be able to, to take decisions with all this information. Then you jump to the negotiation phase. And here we always recommend, uh, remember that uh, win-lose does not exist. Uh, although people say there's no agreement if there is no one win and one lose. And uh, I'm so sorry, but I don't understand the partnerships in this way. As I said, our understanding is that the partnership comes from your weak points and you're looking for someone that will add value here. So definitely there is a need to build a relationship and to bring know-how, expertise, to move forward in the direction you can, okay? You know very well that there is a voluntary exchange zone and you need to understand this zone. Again, there is a strange composition of that. Huh? And we also have the sun, which is good. Okay, so you see absolutely nothing, I guess. Oh, okay. This, by the way, this presentation will be available through the the website of the organizers, so if you need anything, uh, if you find out that anything of this presentation is, is interesting for you, you will have absolutely exactly the same presentation for you. So uh, for the negotiation, more, very important, and I, and I think we have uh, win a lot in, in the terms that people today negotiate with term sheets and not with agreements. But nonetheless, I still see people sending agreements to negotiate. So take your time, and that's something you should build up on your desk phase. Put all the terms in a table, two uh, columns, concept, summary of the concept, and as many pages as you want. It could be seven pages, term sheet, doesn't matter. Put everything there, everything that has to be negotiated, and everything in a term sheet, okay? Very important. Then the agreement, lawyers will enjoy putting all the wording and all these things, but discuss the terms, then the rest. And within the terms, there are so many things to put inside, blah, blah, blah. Well, this is the negotiation. Uh, this is not a training course about negotiation, so I'm not going to go with that. But very important point is to follow up uh, this route. What we see is that you have a first document, okay? And this first document, that you have prepared, have everything inside. All the terms that will be part of the agreement. You build up that and you send to others. Please let them know how they have to work with this document. Because it can become to a crazy colored document that at the end no one understands. So the best way to work is very simple. You know that you can track your changes. So as the others, please connect the track uh, changes Save this version. First of all, someone receives the document. Save it, version one. Save a new document, version two. And then track changes. Put all the changes you want, comments and all the things, and send to the other part. Then the other part receives. Save this version. So the counterpart has the version one and the version two. And start to make changes. The changes also include accepting the other changes. So. It's important then when the other part has made the change and you accept, go there and accept. Then it turns into black ink and it makes the document more readable. 
But what happens? That people start to make changes and changes and changes and changes, and nobody accepts the previous changes. So at the end, you are completely lost. Our recommendation is every time you receive one of these documents, save it because you need to track all the documents and make your changes, accept the changes from the other side, make your comments, and send this new document. Two additional things. Whenever you make a change, first, explain the reasons. And better than explaining the reasons in the document, which makes very difficult to read, in your email, explain the reason. I changed the law because my boss says that blah, blah, blah. And we only can accept England and, I don't know, Switzerland. OK. We propose this and this and this. And then the document will go together with an email that explains every single change. And on top, call the other part, say, look, I'm going to send that to you. Whenever you have a document in front of you, please call me, and we will discuss the changes. Again, common sense. But you know how many people send documents up and down and they never talk? They just spend time sending and sending and sending. Say, but do you understand the reason? Oh, look, they have changed that, and they don't have any reason for that, and I'm not going to accept. How would they think that I'm going to accept that? Then what, you are starting to break the relationship, and you are at the end of the process. So take your time. And if you see that something is being complicated, take a plane, fly, sit down, and have a coffee, and discuss. Or even, again, if there is any worldwide congress where you can discuss an agreement, face-to-face, -face, people normally smile and are more flexible. But keep using the old tool of the, of the telephone, okay? Very important. Uh, some people ask us, is there a need to sign a letter of intent? This looks like an old way of doing things. Today, people go so fast that they don't have time to sign letter of intent. Well, okay, I see two points here. The first point is, I like to sign the term sheets because, you know, when you have a term sheet that you have been discussing for three months and you have an agreement in place, look for the person that can sign, make them sign, and then this document sent to the lawyers. Have two reasons for that. The first thing is that although there is a risk of changes, or signing a term sheet does not mean signing uh, an agreement, so there potentially can be changes in the way, but there is a higher commitment. And when this arrives to the lawyer's department, they see that there is a commitment there. So they focus more on what they have to add value. Otherwise, they start to, I don't have anything about uh, lawyers, but I've seen a lot of lawyers giving opinion of things that the companies have already agreed. So they say, hey, I understand you have to justify your work, but this has been agreed. So stop changing these kind of things. But if you sign the term sheet, you have a lot in value of that. So in the term sheet, you can add a uh, pre-page, like a letter saying, these term sheets have been discussed over the last six months. Companies have arrived to an agreement or a, a letter of understanding, letter of intent. And with this letter, we annex the term sheet, sign it, understanding that within the next three months, we will be able to sign a file and agreement. It's also a way to commit in a certain way that from this point, in the next three months, you are not going to close a deal with anyone else because you have arrived to a certain level. But you have to limit that in time. You have to say, okay, that's open for three months. But if you think that because we have a letter of intention, we are not going to sign a deal in the next year, you are wrong. So keep on speeding up the process. We can give you exclusivity for three months, but within this frame time, we need to take a, arrive into an agreement. So the letter of intent mixed with a term sheet, my recommendation is yes, we should do that. Not very complicated one, just defining the terms, saying, well, this gives an exclusivity for a certain period of time. And also reflecting the time you have in best to arrive to that point, because it's good information within the organization to, to read. So, so at the end, you arrive to the agreement. An agreement, this is a long definition. This is, a, this is the one we give. It's when two parts agree to something reasonable, which does not adversely affect to other people. Huh? We cannot agree certain things, so we, we need to agree on things that do not adverse to other people. Uh, this is a good lawyer that uh, this is the only book I've been able to read about uh, 
style of contract drafting. So I am a medical doctor, so I'm not very good in laws. But uh, in certain way, if someone wants to have a reference book in, 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 in contract drafting, drafting, this is definitely a good one. Maybe it's the third or fourth edition, I don't know. But it's really very useful, and there are a lot of uh, tricky things that should be known. So my recommendation is, if you are not a lawyer, uh, you can have uh, this book as a support. So we have the le letter of intention, we have the term sheets, let's, let's jump to the agreement discussion. And exactly the same, agreement, track changes, numbers and versions, and blah, blah, blah. Meet as much as you can, conference calls as much as you can, try to involve the lawyers in the discussions, not just from their desk, sending contracts without uh, having face-to-face -face discussions, and use all the techniques you need. And that's it, and, and it looks as we arrive to the end and say, fantastic, we have an agreement, let's go on. But we decided, you know, we have had so many experiences whenever we have an agreement in place that we decided to create a phase that is called closing phase. Because the closing phase is not only the signature. You know, another example. When I, uh, before working at Triformat, I used to work in a pharmaceutical company as a marketing director, international marketing director. And when I met the company, for my surprise, there was an agreement signed with an uh, Italian group that uh, was signed and the business development department signed and was in the business development folders. But they were there. Why? Because basically nobody took care after signing for the transfer process. So nobody thought that after the signature, all the people involved were very happy, there was an agreement, but nobody from that group organized a meeting with the ones that should take care of the registration, marketing, and all that. So that's why I'm saying, first, in the closing process, go for the signature. It looks a very simple process, but can take long, especially when strange things start to happen. Suddenly, the person that has to sign is in a, has been, I don't know, married, and it's in traveling, uh, for a honeymoon, then comes back from the honeymoon, but suddenly has a problem, and in three months does not come back to the office. Then you know that the board has decided to change the general manager, and then, well, and the new general manager, of course, will not accept an agreement that has not been done under their supervision. So, what it looks simple, try to speed up and be sure that it is signed in the shorter time as possible. So, breaking the signature process, of those who have not been involved during the negotiation, another important thing. Remember when I said at the beginning, when you are in the first meeting, try to understand the decision process. That's very important because if someone in the decision process or the person that signs is not involved during the process, is the best person to say at the end, ah, I didn't know anything about that. So it's good that the person that has to sign is involved, at least in conference calls, know what is going on, etc., etc. Okay? So the uh, the signature is an important process and it's not as simple as it like some companies have what they call uh, a monthly meeting for approvals and then it looks like it was the week before and then you have an agreement to be signed and say yes but our meeting is at the end of ne next month and during this month everything can happen so try to understand all these things and try to play with all that and whenever you sign an agreement a next step please who is going to take care of that now we are in uh, R&D stage. We are in preclinical, in clinical. We are in regulatory stage. Uh, we, ha we need the marketing people involved. We need the steering committee. Even the steering committee, I, 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 I've seen some companies that make an agreement at the, let's say, uh, they, they still have need some, some field trials to be done. And they build up between the owner and the commercial company a steering committee where marketing people, regulatory people, and aren't everything, everyone is there. And this steering committee is within the agreement. The agreement says there's going to be a committee. We're going to meet every month. In this meeting, these people will be uh, participating, and those are the steps we fix. So the transfer process could be included into the agreement. And if you do that, the probability that everything happens, it's, it's higher because it's part of the agreement. You, you, by law, all parts have to commit on these committees. So the transfer process is not so, so, let's say, simple. And the more 
uh, definition you put on that and the more commitment you put on that, the more rate of success you will have in the partnership because at the end the partnership is not the signature of the agreement. The partnership is the process that you have after, okay? So the joint committees, steel committees, uh, these kind of committees are very useful. So that's all about what we understand about partnerships in animal health and all the things that has to be done. Again, um, uh, I would not be surprised if all of you said, I, I did not learn anything new today, but it put my ideas in place. There are a lot of things to be done and the probability that this modeling and this way of working helps you to build up your partnerships, uh, I'm quite sure that uh, will be a value for you. Additionally, uh, we, and it's a pity that we see that managing 30, 50 companies in a process and sometimes a business development person or a manager, per, a manager of these kind of things manage three, four, five, ten 10 projects with 30 companies at the same time. So it's managing maybe 300 com companies at the same time. They use the email uh, software let's say Outlook or anyone else, as their management tool. Sorry, but this is out of any sense. So a project itself is defined by tasks and time. So you need to, to define your tasks, you need to make a priority on your task, you need to decide how you are going to manage these projects, and you need an IT management system. Otherwise, it's just you are driving your activities just by a uh, a strange force that is called email that gives the priority depending on your inbox and, and, and at the end of the day you are lost, absolutely lost. So our recommendation is, remember the, within the uh, skills, one was project management. So our recommendation is waste a lot of time building up the flowcharts that you need to properly manage all that. And part of that is in, in this presentation but there is a part that links to your company and the internal evaluation process, the internal decision process, and all these things. So invest your time. This is not old fashioned. This is a need, and you need to build up your flowcharts. Build them up and then select an IT system that let you define your task, your priorities, and what you have to do every day. It's so simple, but if you don't have these tools, you will be driven by your inbox and the probability of success of making partnership because your inbox says today A, a B, or C, it's, it's a disaster, really. So build up your flowcharts, select any kind of IT system, better if it's a cloud system because you will have access anywhere in the world. That should give you the priority of your task, definition, timings, overview task, and all these kinds of things, your GANs, your flowcharts, everything there, and work as a project manager. Otherwise, you are going to be absolutely lost because the network you manage when you do partnerships is so huge. So whenever you have that, build up your task using the, the systems and hopefully you will be more successful. So that's all from my presentation. I don't know if it's uh, on time or out or in or more or less. Uh, I will be more than happy to answer your questions here after whenever you want. Hopefully that will be useful for your everyday work. I said this presentation, it's, it's there. If anyone wants to download from the website of the organizers, thank you very much for inviting me. Hopefully you will have enjoyed this presentation and I said uh, I wish you to be more successful in your partnerships, although I'm, I think I'm, most probably you are very successful. Thank you very much.